Hello, my name is Paula Santos and I am the Senior Manager of Learning and Engagement at Intuit, the Center for Intuitive and Outside Our Arts. And today we have a really great program for all of you. Uh, we will be hearing from one of our celebrated scholars and authors. Uh, and before I pass over the floor, I want to say that uh, this year is the 30th anniversary of Intuit. So we're celebrating with all of these special events and inviting some of our uh, most uh, closest uh, scholars and relationships that we have in order to help us celebrate um, the legacy that uh, we have had so far. Um, Along with that, I wanna invite you to our other programs. Um, right now we're gonna hear about Henry Darger, uh, but we have many other programs where we talk about different works of art. Tomorrow we're gonna to be making some art together. Um, so just stay in the loop with us. Uh, another thing about the room is that um, Deb and Lisa will have you know, a very free-flowing conversation um, throughout it. If you have a thought or a question or something that comes up, um, I invite you to use the chat. We're gonna be keeping track of it and um, all of us uh, really refer to it to, you know, kind of take the temperature of um, how things are going <laughs> with all of you. Uh, if uh, some of you are joining us from other places other than Chicago. Please let us know. We love to know that. And without further ado, I want to introduce Deb Carr into its president and CEO. Uh, thank you so much for being in conversation with our wonderful scholar. And I'll hand over the floor to you, Deb. Thanks a lot, Paula. And I'm so pleased to welcome Lisa Runquist uh, virtually back to Intuit. Lisa is a art history professor at the University of North Carolina at Asheville. In 2017, she curated an amazing exhibit here at Intuit uh, betwixt and between Henry Darger's Vivian Girls. And as a result of that exhibition and some further scholarship that she did, um, she has a book coming out today. So we are celebrating Lisa's new book. She's gonna talk about the book, but Lisa, I'm so excited about this book. I hope you don't mind if I say that I have a, I feel a, a teeny tiny bit of, of pride that Antoine had a, had, a had a little part in um, helping you move toward um, this, this amazing new book by uh, Rutledge Publishers. I would um, characterize it as more than a teeny little part. I would say it was a major part. Um, and I do wanna thank you and all your staff at Intuit, your board members. Um, you've given me multiple opportunities to uh, test out some of my ideas, to validate these ideas, uh, to get them out to the public with um, some short essays, but also that show in 2017. And your staff has just been nothing but encouraging and supportive and so professional. Um, and it trickles down from the top. So um, thank you for everything you've done to include me um, and to you know really make me feel uh, ten feet tall. <laughs> you know well, you're you're definitely you're definitely part of our extended team. So uh, thank you, Lisa, for being part of that. I am coming to you from into it. I'm in the Henry Darger room. And I'm just going to have a little caveat here. The internet is not working. Um, we were we were joking ahead of time that, that Henry might have been uh, messing with our, our internet today. Sometimes I like to think that if the spirit of Henry Darger is anywhere, it's right here where I'm at. And uh, so if you lose me, I'll be back. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, Lisa, Lisa can uh, handle this program on her own. She doesn't even need me. So I'm just, I'm just here to- uh, I'll tell some jokes. <laughs> yeah, pr prompt, prompt you along. So Lisa, this book is about, uh, really focuses on um, the cuteness of little girls, little girlhood, and to some extent, the gender fluidity. And, and you and I have had many conversations about this. And Lisa, I think that the scholarship you've brought forth presents us with the best insights that I've ever seen as to um, why the characters, the Vivian girls and the other children in Henry Darger's opus, In the Realms of the Unreal, 
um, gender shift. And I'm, I'm so excited that you're bringing that to light for a wider audience. Um, tell, me, tell me about sort of your uh, research journey to uncover some of the, the insights that, that you have in the book and, and shine a little bit more of a light on those insights. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, before I start, I want to say hi to Zoe, my former student. Hey, Zoe. Um, so Paula, could you bring up, I have a few images and a few things to um, help illustrate that, that journey of uh, thought. And one of the things that um, I wanted to do with Henry Darger's work is to contextualize it within cultural resources. Uh, and of course, Intuit's archives are, um, you know, just so significant um, in, in that way for me to uh, get closer to those resources. So I look for patterns in Henry Darger's work, and I was very intrigued by his use of children. And then in particular, the phrase little girls, they're always little. Um, I wanted to think about what does little mean? What is the significance of that? And so I started searching for possibilities of examples that he might use from culture. And I found it in this opening statement, why little girls are heroines of this story. So I've highlighted a few uh, parts here that says that, you know, this is why the little girls are actual heroes, because under most circumstances, women are braver than men, and goes on to talk about their courage and at the bottom, I, I found this interesting, in patient endurance of pain and suffering and sorrow, all women were and are immeasurably superior to men and women always make sacrifices that men would think of in horror. <laughs> That's quite the statement. Um, but what caught my attention was how about the play known as The Little Rebel? Was not she braver than the soldiers in that play? So that, of course, prompted me to look up what is The Little Rebel? I didn't know what that was. Um, Paula, if you could do the next slide. And I found out that The Little Rebel was a play in 1911. And that play was turned into The Littlest Rebel, so made even more diminutive. Uh, and the star was Shirley Temple. It was one of her real breakout films. She plays the daughter of a Confederate spy, which to me seems so much in Henry Darger's wheelhouse because it's a Civil War narrative. And this play was, or this, excuse me, this movie was part of the merchandising of Shirley Temple. And it was talked about in the paper. There's a little clipping there. There are multiple books made. And this is the poster from the movie. And her stance is kind of arms akimbo stance um, is how she stands up to the Union soldiers that come onto the plantation. So um, she is someone who Darger says is brave. Uh, even though um, she's actually defending her, her home while her father is away. Um, next, please. And these are some film stills. So her father is there, daddy's there on the left, and she's looking very lovingly into his eyes. And the Union general is on the right. And in the climax of the movie, she sits on Abraham Lincoln's lap and negotiates the release of her father. Uh, she shares an apple with him. So Shirley Temple is often, I started thinking about Shirley Temple more and looking into her in general. She was really the face of childhood in the 1920s and early 30s. She is someone that Darger, um, of course, had memorabilia from. And she is viewed in these movies as a redemptive figure. She redeems lonely bachelors and uh, cantankerous widows. Uh, she's paired with men and her in, in the movies, either she is motherless or the mother figure dies early on in the film and Shirley Temple becomes the main female character. So I, I started finding some patterns here in terms of also thinking about Darger as um, a young man and when he was four, his mother died. And there are some links here between some of these um, exemplars of girlishness that Darger um, clings to in his work. But Shirley Temple was such um, an influence on just the idea of childhood, the cuteness, the kind of coquetry, um, the charm. And she is almost always sitting on men's laps. And um, after reading about her 
stardom that her, the people that came to the movie theater, many were men. I mean, she was really viewed um, by society at this time period as this orphaned, almost orphaned, kind of bouncing around between people that wanted to adopt her in these movies. She's really viewed as this figure that could redeem um, someone, that could really kind of pull them out of um, you know, economic strife or um, she was, you know, one, one scholar referred to her as someone who could redeem the sentimental economy of men. I thought that was a great kind of phrase. Um, next slide, please. So I looked into the little rebel, littlest rebel, and found this in the archives, um, the Henry Darger belongings in the archives at the American Folk Art Museum. And so Darger had um, a, a, you know, printed fan kind of, um, you know, picture. Uh, it's got a hole at the top, so um, it's been pinned up for many years. And this picture is probably around 1934-35 is a date of it. Uh, it has printed on it, your friend Shirley Temple, but at the bottom in pencil, which you can't read here, it says for Lorraine Wirtz. Uh, so he probably fished it out of someone's garbage and kept it all these years. And it's in fairly good shape. Um, he also took pencil and penciled in her pupils, um, which we see that a lot in his other Vivian girls. Uh, he does that same kind of reflective technique in their pupils, I guess. Uh, okay, so the next, please. The other little character or little example that I found in his work um, is Saint Therese. And is it Lisieux? Is that the, the proper? Lisieux, yeah. Lisieux. Lisieux. <laughs> so <laughs> she called herself the little flower of Christ. And the little flower of Christ um, is known as a doctor of the Catholic Church in that her theological uh, writings are highly regarded as she's seen as a significant figure in, in Catholicism, excuse me. Um, her mother died when she was four. This is an interesting connection to um, Henry Darger. She died at age 24 of tuberculosis. And so she died very young. She's known as a little girl saint in many ways. And her writings are called the little way. And in her writings, she often uses floral metaphors to talk about gardens, and here she singles out um, in this, um, the world of souls, Jesus's garden. It's not the lily or the rose that really stand out. It is the little violet or the delightful simplicity of the daisy. And then at the bottom here, you know, daisies and violets are destined to give joy to God's glances. Um, so the humble and the small are the messages here that she um, you know, provides in these metaphors and these tropes of flowers. So she's canonized in 1925, um, in the same time period when Darger is really working hard at his um, major writings and starting some of his uh, imagery. Next, please. So she's pictured in this one of these Darger works. She's in the left corner. And darker used holy cards here. So there is a sacred heart of Jesus on the right, a traced crucifixion in the center, and then on the left, in a they're like pendants in the background, is Saint Therese. And in the foreground are the Vivian girls. And according to the caption, uh, you can see here that Jenny is wanting to offer her sight uh, for the conversion of John Manley, her worst enemy. Saint Therese was a confessor saint, which means that she confessed her willingness to sacrifice herself, to cleanse uh, the sins of others. So in some way, it seems like Jenny is also doing that, wanting to offer, sacrifice something of herself here. So I see this image as these are, this is, you know, really contextual background of thinking about martyrdom, sacrifice, in a very Catholic kind of lens that Darger places uh, behind the Vivian girls as the story unfolds. If we could go to the next, please. So here's a, a close up of that image. And um, St. Therese is known for wearing a nun's habit, and she usually carries a crucifix 
um, a large crucifix with flowers that sometimes tumble um, off of that and even a, a little floating baby Jesus that she gazes lovingly at here in this image. There's a holy card down here at the bottom. Um, and I just have a quick image that we'll look at closer of the Society of the Little Flower newsletter that's in Intuit's collection. So there is a, you know, kind of a, a grounding, a foundation of thinking about littleness and the, um, the context that she kind of, I feel Darger puts the Vivians within. Um, and of course the two Vivians that have floral names are Daisy and Violet, those same humble, meek, small flowers that give joy to God's glances. And the, and the two exact flower names that uh, Saint Therese mentions in her writings. Yes, yes. Uh, next, please. And the other little character that he uses as a yardstick to measure Vivian virtue is little Eva or Evangeline St. Clair from Uncle Tom's Cabin. And he mentions her several times in his writings. Uh, I have yet to see anything that's visual, but there's a lot of uh, text, textual uh, mentioning of her. And of course she is blonde haired, blue eyed, about the same age as um, the Shirley Temple character, the same age as also the Vivians. So here he is um, kind of measuring up the Vivians and it says, and no Evangeline St. Clair could beat them in their kind loving ways and their love for God. So there's always this context of them as being Christian too. Um, they're kind, they're loving, they are willing to sacrifice themselves. And so this is how Darger kind of shapes girlhood in my mind, in my eyes, uh, through these kind of little characters. Um, and his girls are always little girls. So to me, littleness is some sort of factor uh, that plays into his work. Um, if little Eva dies in Uncle Tom's cabin. Um, she, when she dies, there's a great kind of, um, almost like an apotheosis scene where she kind of sees heaven. And sometimes when Darger writes about girls um, being murdered or uh, on the battlefield, they often see heaven too. They shout out those kinds of things. Um, next, please. So I do have a chapter on littleness. Um, you can't write about Henry Darger's Vivian girls without dealing uh, with their bodily modifications. And so this was one thing that I really wanted to tackle. And it's often the main question people have. And it's, it's also the element in Darger's art that can um, provoke knee-jerk reactions. So I thought, here's a great challenge. How am I going to work with this? And so I started again thinking about patterns and I was looking at patterns in the visual art because he doesn't write about this in the book. There isn't any mention of this kind of morphology or hybridity in the book. So I started looking at images where this, um, I'm gonna to refer to it as a modification or an adaptation happens uh, to the, the girls. And it's typically when they're running, um, which makes sense because parting legs then reveal things, I guess you could say. But it's also in moments when they are in peril or than fighting um, and they are, um, on the run, you know, this chapter is called Girls on the Run. Um, next, please. Here's another detail. Uh, so this, um, you know, propensity to show children running, fighting, moving uh, with this kind of adaptation, maybe begin to think about there's, and it's, it's frequent in his work. So there's something meaningful in this. It's not just, um, in my mind, um, a random kind of, oh, I'll just draw this in. Um, there's some kind of meaning to them and put it within the bigger context of these girls are for him. Um, he refers to them as martyrs. They are um, little saints. They um, are contextualized within kind of sainthood in many ways in his work. So to me, this is not, uh, this hybridity is not a sign of something that is a pejorative or evil um, or anything bad. It is um, something that coexists um, and aligns with the sense of them as being her heroines, as being um, holy. Um, so I started to think about that. I love this image, this detail too, because of the flowers. And often flowers have both sex 
organs, if you, you know, many flowers do. Um, the flowers also help make the girls seem little, which I love that too, that they're gigantic flowers and the girls seem more smaller underneath them. Um, next, please. <clears throat> and this is a tracing. We had this piece in the bet Betwixt and Between show. Uh, so Darger frequently would glean these kinds of images from, uh, this is a Sears Roebuck page, uh, and he would trace along the body lines and really um, many ways defrock the children to kind of reveal, um, and the way that I write it is kind of reveal the mysteries of Vivian Hood. Um, and so, you know, my, my take on this is to not automatically think of this as some sort of sexualization of the child. I don't see any real indication of that in the writing, in the book, um, in his, you know, life story. Um, and as I look at this as a, the realms of the unreal as a story, it's a story of a magical place. It's the unreal. Um, and there are children that get modified with horns and they have butterfly wings and they're blengans that are cats and dragons. Um, why is, why not, you know, it's possible that we could have um, human beings running around that are the merging of male and female. To me, that seems like that could uh, be just part of this magical world and things that happen there. Um, next, please. Well, and Lisa, you and I have talked about um, maybe these girls actually have the power to transform yeah. in, in certain situations, in danger or in battle or when they're running. Yeah, I often, I, I think of it as, you know, that's when it tends to happen in his work. And maybe it is this, this way that they adapt to, to the moment. And um, with the word Vivian, um, one of the derivations is, is the word vivam, which means I shall live. And it's the last word of Ovid's metamorphosis, by the way, which I found very interesting. Um, and I often think of them as like Shazam, like the Vam, they are, you know, that's, they, they don't die in this story. They go through all kinds of trials and tribulations, things blow up around them and they still live and keep on moving. Um, and often they have these moments of adaptation um, and the height uh, of the drama of the moment. So I started to think about um, female saints. Um, I kind of did a deep dive into Catholicism and I was reading a lot of work by various scholars. And one of them was um, the theologian, Margaret Miles, uh, who talks about this phrase becoming male. And she uh, was writing about female saints and overall female saints um, practice forms of asceticism. They um, you know, break away from patriarchal figures in their family and the domestic domesticity. So they're very much involved in breaking away from their social norms. Um, and they often change bodily appearance. Some of them do more, I don't know if you would call this traditional, but conventional, they might levitate or they may have the stigmata, while other women, uh, according to their legends and their, their stories, grew beards, uh, became more male physically in many ways. Um, and all this was equated with exhibiting spiritual fortitude, becoming more like Christ, being Christ-like as this orientation towards maleness, either in social standing or kind of physicality. And here's just a few that she mentions, Thecla, Galatia, St. Vilgefortis, who did grow the beard. Um, Vilgefortis really means strong virgin. Um, of course, there's Joan of Arc and then Vivia Perpetua. And, uh, and I was familiar with Joan of Arc, so I looked into that in Darger's work. Um, next, please. And Darger does talk about her and equates the bravery um, of the um, Vivians leading men into battle with that of the, the spirit of the maid of Orleans herself. Um, so he um, weaves um, Joan of Arc into some of the text um, and kind of uses her as an example to talk about Vivian heroicism. Next, please. And in this piece, um, I do believe that she is pictured here um, in the same way as we had with St. Therese. There is on the left side of the image, a hanging painting um, that I believe is Joan of Arc praying before going into battle. Um, it's very similar to a lot of other holy cards. I, don't, I haven't found an exact match yet. 
uh, but there is a um, halo behind her. And then of course her horse is there. And to the left of that, there is a traced image of a crucifixion. So we have that male and female pa uh, pairing again of um, sacrifice martyrdom. And the storyline is that Vivi uh, Violet Vivian stood in front of a bullet and took the bullet so the priest uh, could be saved. And so she is in the bed and the other Vivians pray around her. Um, so this tale of sacrifice, and, and what I really enjoy about this work too, is that there's a praying Vivian in the front right, and she is kind of paired, or you could kind of pull the thread between her and then the praying Joan of Arc, um, that she's very much front and center there. Uh, next, please. And Joan of Arc was very popular at this time period when Darger was beginning to write his story. She was canonized in 1920. There were World War I posters with her on them. I love this. Joan of Arc saved France, so women buy your war saving stamps. <laughs> you know, save America by being consumers. Um, but uh, her image was everywhere. Um, and there are lots of um, statues that were made at women's colleges, in particular of Joan of Arc in the early 20th century. Uh, and so Darger, it's not a stretch to think that Darger would um, embrace her as a kind of exemplar for um, the heroics of the Vivian girls. Next, please. And even St. Therese, who called herself the daughter of Joan of Arc, she wrote two plays, The Mission of Joan, and Joan of Arc accomplishes her mission, and this is her dressed up as Joan of Arc. <laughs> so um, there's there's interconnections going on here. Um, next, please. And the last uh, person on that list of becoming male uh, is Vivia Perpetua, who I, I was not familiar with, but the name seems, you know, everlasting life. Uh, Vivia Perpetua is at the top of that list of becoming male. And as I um, learn more about her story, um, she was someone who was martyred in a Colosseum and had several dreams prior to that moment of her martyrdom, but the dream before she went into the Colosseum was that she uh, dreamt she was walking in and she was getting prepared to fight and she, they stripped her naked, which was common for athleticism uh, to go into the Colosseum for men, and she said she looked down and I became a man. Like she had, she had this transgender dream and this was her way, this was like her armor or her preparation or her adaptation to go in and fight. Um, she also has moments where she separates from her family. She has a child that she gives up, um, all of this to be Christian and to, um, you know, this kind of fortitude uh, that were really Roman pagan qualities that were attributed to manhood. Um, were written onto her story. Um, and I, her feast day prayer here is interesting to me too. Pray today for mothers separated from their families and children, especially through injustice and violence. Um, there are thousands of children and, and little girls in particular in Darger's story that are separated from their families. Um, so I, some of this maybe just seem to fit. I just think all of it is kind of in Darger's wheelhouse Perpetua is mentioned during the Roman um, high mass. Um, she's one of a few women that are mentioned. So um, she is very much honored and she's equated with having Christ-like fortitude. Um, so she's really seen as very male, very masculine in that way, a virile saint, as they say. So, um, so that's what um, the other things that I talk about are um, the aesthetics of cuteness. And, and I think that really will come out when we look at some pieces in in the darker room. But thank you for sitting through that. But that's a that's a little taste of the book. That's wonderful, Lisa. It's wonderful. And is that your is that your last slide? It is my last slide, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, so maybe um, maybe I can show here. Paula, maybe you can highlight me and I can show that we have that wonderful newsletter from the Society of the Little Flower here. And that's, that society was in Chicago. And uh, the newsletter is from 1932. It's in pretty pristine condition. Like he saved it for four decades. Um, yeah, it looks great. And there are a couple was, other newsletters in the American Folk Art Museum too. So he was probably a member 
um, mm -hmm. of that group. Well, it says, dear client of the little flower. That's pretty interesting. And uh, uh, Lisa knows this. Before I even came to into it, I had visited Saint Teresa's home. And she has a beautiful, she does have a beautiful, the house still has a beautiful garden uh, next to the house. So it's a French, French museum and monument. Lisa, I love this magazine that is in our collection here at, at Intuit. And um, here we can see these shifting hemlines, mm -hmm. little girls and uh, littler girls and uh, mothers with their different hemlines. Yeah, especially the, the youngest girls that are near the crease of the magazine are wearing little fashions. They are referred to as little fashions in uh, magazines as well as in advertisements of the time period that are clipped and kept and their hemlines are higher so they show a little they show their knees and a little bit of their thigh and that is very much a Shirley Temple silhouette um, she had all kinds of um, little girl wear that um, she sold and she really influenced the fashion of the time period but Darger um, kept all those and really put his girls in the right or I guess the what society said was a little girl fashion. Absolutely. And I've actually seen some some works where on one side of the work, the, the girls seem very little with the shorter skirts. And on the re reverse side of the artwork, they seem a little older and they have a little bit longer hemline, just like you say. Uh, Lisa, we have some other wonderful objects here that that have influenced your thinking about about Darger and uh, cuteness and little littleness. Some yeah, the, very nice the, pieces. I became interested in you know Darger's choice of the look of childhood, the look of girlhood, and he you know moved from working with collage and photographs to these very graphic linear drawings, which allowed him to then manipulate them very easily and trace them and make them move and stick their tongues out or you know add little additions to them. Um, but they are all this, um, they come from a commodified image of, of childhood, which is interesting to me. And that image very much pulls at our heartstrings. It is the, you know, the, um, the large forehead and the slightly clumsy body. Um, and notice here that uh, this is a blonde haired girl, which also is a Vivian trait. Um, he's colored it in to, you know, follow the directions, yellow, red, blue. Um, but he had a whole collection of uh, coloring books and all the coloring books are these blissful images of childhood and it, it just struck me that this was not his childhood, you know, this is, right. this is kind of an imagined space of childhood bliss that kids are um, acting out their social roles for little girls or little boys. Um, yeah, speaking, of, speaking of social roles, I hope you can see this. This is, uh, I refer to her as little cooking girl. And if you've looked at very many of Darger's artworks, you see her repeatedly through his artworks, um, not always cooking, doing different things, but that same sort of front view stance. Um, mm -hmm. In some cases like this, she's looking down, but in other cases, as you say, he's colored the eyes in so that she looks like she's looking right out at the viewer. Yeah, he uses her quite a bit and then we'll replace the the bowl with something else. He may have three or four of her standing in a row and they're all doing something slightly different. Um, so the those kinds of images allow Darger to use repetition, you know, in a very clever way. Absolutely. I, I noticed that really striking rep repetition of the four, the detail of the four running girls with the flowers above them. I think that repetition is, is a really significant uh, theme that we see over and over again. Yeah, and there, the work. there is that little um, little girl silhouette of the the um, the cut of the hemline here. The I guess the raincoat is uh, um, on the thigh, and that gives us an indication of her age. Um, Darker also liked the girls with braids. Um, they're they're pretty cute. And sometimes the braids are flopping around as they're running and moving and he modified them to make them look like they were in action. Well, I'm not glad that you mentioned braids, Lisa, as so often happens, we're in, in sync. I picked up this image, which we haven't looked at recently. And here you have him uh, practicing. I think this is a traced image and he's practicing his braids here. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you, you'll find images just of braids or just of a knee or just of a sock. Uh, he really looked at those kinds of details, even though we might think this image isn't that detailed. Um, it's all yeah. based on that kind of linear yeah, movement. The, yeah, we've got the sock, we've got the knee, we've got the him trying to do toes with not very good success here, but. <laughs> yeah, and he could flip that over and then use it to have her look towards the right or look towards the left. So um, he would often do both of those. Here's another image that we see often in the artworks. Um, here we can see clearly that this is little Miss Muffet uh, running away from the spider who sat down beside her. But we see her in lots of artworks uh, going, going both directions. Mm -hmm. And here's another uh, little image that he's drawn next to little Miss Muffet. And we see her a lot in the artwork too. Yeah, Darker really searched for images of girls moving or their mouth open or their eyes wide or their hair flung to one side or the other. And that would help him create those action packed scenes. Um, yeah, he uses little uh, Miss Muffet quite a bit. Not with the spider, though. She's usually without her spider. No, she's without her spider, right? Exactly. Uh, Lisa, do you want to comment on, on this particular image? This one's pretty dramatic. It's not your typical. Um, clipping from a coloring book. This is a um, a, a cartoon, a political cartoon. Mm -hmm. It says modern, modern warfare. Yeah, and what's striking to me, of course, the figure in the front uh, that looks resilient and obviously a bomb has gone off and some people are on the ground, possibly dead. Others are running, but the one figure that is still fairly upright is a, a little girl. Um, and she reaches up and yells into the air. Uh, I'm sure he found this to be striking. And, and this is, you know, an image for him of that kind of the heroics of little girls, how they're not afraid. Mm -hmm. And then I pulled a, a, a new one that I thought was sort of nice because as we're talking about flowers, you can see some flower practices here mm -hmm. where he's been practicing his flowers and practicing his storm clouds is, is really exciting. Uh, weather is up above the flowers. Yeah, what I love about his flowers is that he also uses them kind of against the patternings of the girl's clothes. Um, and in those coloring books, you'll see like checkerboard patterns and polka dots. And then you start getting all those reverberating patterns of flowers and they're everywhere and, um, you know, the black, the black eyes of the girls and they're doing this and the polka dots and there's flowers and it, it just everything starts to kind of hum. Uh, he, he was really great at using pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's one of the things that's so appealing about the artworks is that repetition, the pattern. Mm -hmm. And what the one thing that I talk about with um, cuteness in his work is that it's not just um, something you know that he was attracted to or picked up i think it also works in his art for a reader even or or a viewer even if it's imagined and of course we are not imagined viewers we are actually looking at his work today but there's something about cute little girls that um, along with that idea comes vulnerability um, and that i think that creates some of the knee-jerk reaction in his work is that he is exploiting that sense of how that child, even if it's just a representation from a coloring book or comic book, really, really pulls at us, really makes us have this sense of protection, um, care for that child. And I think he, um, you know, he's writing this 15,000 page story. Um, how else do you keep someone's attention long enough um, you then threatened the very thing that they want to protect. And when we see this in the work, even though it is cartoonish and it kind of looks childlike to us, um, as we know, it's, you know, it's very complex work, um, but we're drawn to it because of that some kind of subconscious pull at that cute aesthetic um, that we want, to, um, we want to see cared for. Um, and there's a there's a great um, uh, thought about cuteness is that um, it's difference from beauty is that you put beauty up on a pedestal and cuteness you put on your lap. 
So uh, in my chapter on cuteness, I do talk a lot about Shirley Temple because uh, that is her MO in her movies as she is that cute, coquettish, knowing girl that is, you know, also manipulative um, and, uh, you know, a little spunky. And those were, that's Darger's child. That's the child he's gleaning from all these comic strips and coloring books. Fantastic, Lisa. Well, uh, Lisa, do you have a copy of the book with you? Do, do you have one? I do. You? I yes. have this copy. I also have this. <laughs> okay, great. So, well, uh, my book doesn't is in, has black and white images. It's not a picture book. It is a book of ideas and uh, words. Um, but it's great to pair with Betwixt and Between, which is a beautiful book of some words and, a, and much more pictures. <laughs> right. so, um, but yeah, they, they pair well together. They do. I just asked uh, if we could put the link for both books in. And uh, we are offering a, a special. So if you are, were here tonight, you get a 20% off. And although the book can be found in other places, I do encourage you to consider purchasing it from Intuit because it does support Intuit when you purchase from us. And uh, we did publish the Betwixt and Between catalog, which is the catalog of the exhibition that Lisa curated here in 2017 as part of a year of celebrating Darger. There's been a lot of celebrating Darger this week, Lisa. Um, our colleague, Philippe Cohen-Solal, has uh, launched his new multimedia project, a website, a new album, a um, podcast um, the, on the website are um, is a way to find all of the um, sites in the world that have Henry Darger material. And that was just launched um, two days ago on Monday, which was uh, celebrating Henry Darger's birthday. And the um, English version of the podcast uh, launches next week. Mm -hmm. And you and I are both guests on that podcast. So uh, keep, keep a watch out for um, you and I speaking. And he, um, I think next week, the first episode that will launch is an episode where he talks to Kyoko Lerner, who was Darger's landlady, and Betsy Fuchs, who was uh, Darger's neighbor late in life, who lived down the hall from him and brought him a toast and jam in the morning when he was uh, pretty old and feeble. And uh, as a young woman, she and her uh, young husband kind of looked after him in a um, she said, we, we thought we had a bohemian lifestyle, but they were ended up taking care of, of Henry quite a bunch. So um, she doesn't do interviews anymore, but she said, I couldn't resist um, being, being on this podcast with the rest of you. So all of that is happening. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, Philippe's website is outsider.co, and that's where you can find the links to, to those. Um, do we have any questions for Lisa? Do, please uh, post your, uh, your questions in the um, in the chat, let us know if you have questions. And Lisa, you've been, um, you've had an, an interesting career. You were, you've been a curator, you've worked in um, art uh, spaces, you are at the, the university now. And how, what led you to Henry Darger? How did that become, um, how, did, how did Henry and, and this art uh, of ours become your passion? Uh, I've always been attracted to artists work that um, involves collage or found objects. Um, I just like to think about the cultural baggage that comes with those items and then how that then affects, you know, how we read the image. Um, I really love Joseph Cornell's work and I wrote my master's thesis on some of his later collages. And I was at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana uh, at that time. And the um, Cranard Art Museum's director, um, Oh, his name just left me. It'll come to me. Um, he um, was friends with the learners and in a new acquisition show, there were three Dargers and I'd never heard about him before. And I remember walking through the gallery and stopping and just looking at these rolling um, panoramic scenes with girls running through them. And I was like, what is this? So I um, looked into his work and uh, was interested in it. And I, of course, I um, bought John McGregor's um, book. And um, I'm not a huge fan of psychoanalytic um, interpretation. And I just thought there was more to do with Darger. And um, 
to me, it seemed obvious that culture was very much part of um, his, his whole um, context for what he was working with. So uh, I then uh, became a curator in South Bend, Indiana at the museum and I put together a big show and I went back and borrowed those three doggers. And that was the, the seed to the show. And once I went around and asked for other work, they would always say, well, what else is in the show? And I said, I have three doggers. And everyone went, oh, okay. So, you know, Carl Hammer, I remember he was like, oh, you have three doggers. Okay, let me show you what I've got here. So yeah. I knew it was um, kind of the key to unlock some things for me. And I decided to go back and get my doctorate. And when I went to University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, I worked with um, Carol Maver, who writes a lot about childhood, but in the photography, uh, 19th century photography, and uh, she was thrilled to learn I wanted to work on Henry Darger, and she had not known anything about him. So, um, and I was actually told by someone, oh, you shouldn't write about him, he's too hot, or, <laughs> or you know, that it, it'll, it'll be a hard subject for you, and I just thought, I just remember Carol said, it will be, it will have some challenges for you. And she said, that's a good thing. Jump right in and do it. So um, everything has kind of spiraled from that. And I do teach classes in outsider art in, uh, in Asheville. Um, and I have worked with the Asheville Art Museum actually on a show there too, that involves some darkers and other artists. So uh, I keep my, my toe dipped into the curatorial pool whenever I can. Well, we're so we're so happy that you pursued Darger because, um, like you, um, I I really think that there's a depth to this work that um, your research has really uncovered. Um, I know that we when we think about outsider artists, we also th often think that they're operating um, outside um, contemporary influences, but clearly um, Darger was was reading. We have right next to me, stacks of Life Magazine and National Geographic and the newspapers he was reading and the clippings he was taking. And we know that he was very aware of um, popular culture, um, contemporary society, that these influenced him. And, uh, and I, for one, think that the work is extremely sophisticated. Um, mm -hmm. And I love how you are helping us to unpack some of those sophisticated themes. Yeah, thank you. I, I often, refer to him as a magpie, that, you know, it's a bird that steals um, pretty things to make their nest or steals things from other nests to make their nest. And I think of him as this great appropriator who brings in, in a really complex way, um, things from Catholic culture, things from um, the newspapers, things from the comic strips. And I've also referred to him as a filter, like he filters culture. Um, and modifies it to his own needs and then produces this huge, fantastic story, you know, this opus um, that just goes on and on and on and on, but it's filled with references um, from, you know, very diverse kinds of sources. I'll, I'll make another plug for, for Intuit, if you don't mind this, and, and you're part of this, this summer, we are going to be doing a series of three exhibitions about Darger's work. We're gonna start by looking at Darger as a reader and an author. We're going to um, then transition to working with you and some others around Darger's techniques and his methods. And then towards the end of the year, we're gonna be thinking about the room itself. Uh, the room is gonna be taken down this year and the objects analyzed for um, conservation care. And we wanna open that entire process up to our guests. Um, we're eventually gonna be renovating space and rethinking how we present the darker room. And we want to definitely have input from our guests. So we're gonna be featuring uh, Darger and the Darger, Henry Darger room um, online and in person. We are open again. We are open. Um, we have been open for about a month on Fridays and Saturdays, but we're going to begin to be open on Sundays. So that's very exciting uh, as we see guests coming back carefully. And of course, we have time ticketing so that people can feel safe and comfortable here. So um, there's, there's a lot happening around Darker. Um, I think Lisa Stone was on earlier. She uh, is also helping us. Michael Bonesteel is helping us, you and Mary Trent. So we've got a, a great lineup of uh, partners to help us think through this. Um, Jonathan has a question. Do you think the presence of male genitalia would undermine the female slash girl empowerment message in the work that ultimately their strength comes from maleness? 
Um, that's a good question. So I think that for me, the that message is a very um, that particular message is a very Catholic uh, hagiography act. Uh, you know, the 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 writings for female saints. It's very much about becoming male, um, and and so that you know the maleness there is kind of um, the priority or the the male qualities characteristics. When I think about Darger's girls, though, he always refers to them as girls. Uh, so I think they are somehow becoming something, but they don't have an endpoint. Uh, I think that they they are all about this kind of raw energy. They have this adaptation, you know, vivam. They can change, and then, uh, but they still remain girls. And there's a there's a part in the Darger's writing that I put into my book where he equates hair and the length of hair to either being a girl or a boy, because the Vivians do disguise themselves as boys and cut their hair short, and then are told to take big steps like stamping around, which makes me think about the lunging steps they take when they are transforming. Um, so Darger frames the idea of gender in terms of hair not necessarily <laughs> other body parts, which I think is really interesting. Um, and that's really specific in, a, in, a, in, in his writing. So for me though, it seems like the boy part of it never takes over. There's still little girls in his eyes. They are still girlish um, and they you know, remain Vivians. And so they're kind of their own creature. You know, I don't, I don't really think of them as being within this binary. They're, they're kind of exist um, beyond that, beyond that sense of the binary, when we talk That's about because that. in the realms of the unreal takes place in another universe. Yeah, yeah, and there's there's also um, you know references to the Wizard of Oz, and there's a character in the Wizard of Oz. His name is Tip. He's a boy, and he goes on all these adventures with the other characters. And at the end of the story, he's told, "Oh, you're really the Princess Ozma." And you have been um, under the spell by a witch, and we need to turn. You need to turn back into the princess and go rule at Ozma. And he does say and looks at the Tin Man and says, "But then I can't run around with you guys anymore. Like I can't have this mobility and this, you know, life with you." But he goes, "I, I guess I will." You know, kind of disgruntled. I guess I'll go be yeah. the princess. And he's changed magically back to the princess. So um, I think. But, he's, but but once he's the princess, he still gets to have adventures in the yeah. uh, the, the subsequent books with uh, the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and so forth. So there, there's something about that fluidity of gender, the kind of enchantment of that. Um, that I think Darger picks up in his work too. Nice. Yeah, very much so. Any other questions for Lisa? Well, Lisa, you've got this, uh, this, this new accomplishment of this book. We're very excited. What's next for you? What's, uh, what's, what's in the future? Uh, working on the show coming up. Um, uh -huh. Actually, I'm very excited about that because I'll be right. I'm, you know, collaborating with other scholars and we're writing about things that nobody else has ever really written about some of the archival material. So it'll be kind of untouched material. And to me, the challenge is to talk about that and and not always base it on um, an actual artwork, although we'll we'll have some artwork in the show, too. Uh, but to really look at the archival material and think deeply about it. Um, beyond that, we're, we're very pleased to have this archival material here at Intuit. And I know that you've um, dug deep into that archive on many occasions. Yeah, yeah. So I am beyond that, I haven't thought yet. I'm still, uh, I'm in the afterglow of the, <laughs> the book. Um, and then this continuation of work with Intuit. So that's, that makes me happy. Well, Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you for all the support and the um, enthusiasm, the partnership with us. Um, we, we, it was an honor for us to um, speak with you this evening and to be the official book launch for this terrific uh, new volume. And I do encourage our audience members to, um, to go online and make a purchase from us and uh, and, and thank you so much for your time, Lisa. It was great uh, to have you here again tonight. I'm, I'm truly thankful and I'm also honored and um, excited. So thank you for um, giving me this time. Thank you very much. And I'll just mention um, 
Uh, tomorrow is art after work at five o'clock. And um, let's see, uh, next week, if you're a member, we're taking a tour of Bob Roth's home. He has a couple of spectacular uh, Dargers in his home. So if you are not a member, please um, go to our website and join us a member. We have a special um, exclusive member tour next week with uh, in the home of Bob Roth and his um, magnificent collection. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Have a really great evening.